Hi there, I'm Lu Schirmann, technical consultant in customer success, and I'm a friend of Max. This video is an overview of the policies you get within API Manager and the option to create your own custom policies as well. We will look into the best practices of working with API Manager and give an example of which policies to apply to which layer within API-led connectivity. So let's get started. Let's start with the different types of policies that API Manager provides. The first type of policies are the default policies. These are the policies that we provide out of the box to all customers with access to API Manager. The policies fall into the categories of security, quality of service, troubleshooting, transformation and compliance. The second type are custom policies. Whenever default out-of-the-box policies are not sufficient for your use case, you can create your own custom policy to meet your specific business needs. For example, customers who require to do some custom data masking without tokenization could develop a custom policy to achieve that goal. Another example could be to implement a custom policy for identity-based payload trimming. And the third type are automated policies. Automated policy means that you can apply any default or custom policy to all of your APIs in an environment. This means that all currently deployed APIs and also all future APIs to be deployed into that specific environment will automatically have the specified policy enabled. So what are the policies that API Manager provides out of the box? Well, here we see the five different categories with its available policies. The first category is all about adding more security on top of your applications, as well as the systems your applications are accessing. In this category, we have policies like OAuth 2.0 access token enforcement, basic authentication with username and password, but also LDAP based. If you want to allow or deny incoming requests for specific IPs or IP ranges, you can use the IP deny list and IP allow list policies. JSON and XML threat protection helps to protect your APIs from unusual inflation of JSON or XML elements, which could lead to a heavy consumption of memory resources in case of an attack. The JWT validation policy allows you to validate the signature of a JSON web token and assert the values of the claims of incoming requests by using a JWT with JWS format. And then we have the tokenization and detokenization, where tokenization in general is the process of masking sensitive data into a token that can be then mapped back to its original value by using detokenization concepts. So if your API contains sensitive data, the tokenization policy is a very effective way to protect it. But please note that tokenization and detokenization is only available for runtime fabric deployments. If you haven't yet, I highly recommend you to watch the Friends of Max video securing access to APIs with API Manager, which goes more into the details of this category. You can find the link in the description below the video. Then we have the category quality of service offering policies to help protect your backend systems from excessive traffic and to ensure that the end user experience is as expected. In this category, we have policies like HTTP caching, which lets you store HTTP responses for later reuse to avoid multiple calls to a backend when responses normally don't change often. There are also policies for rate limiting, both SLA-based and non-SLA-based. The non-SLA-based policy lets you enforce a hard limit, whereas the SLA-based rate limiting policy lets you limit access from client applications based on their SLA. If you want to secure your backend systems from temporary spikes, you can use the spike control policy to do so. Though this sounds similar to the rate limiting policy, there is a difference between the two. The spike control policy puts a request onto a queue as it reaches the limit, whereas the rate limiting policy blocks a request from execution once the quota has been reached. 
The third category is troubleshooting, where you can use the message logging policy to log custom messages using the information from incoming requests, responses from the backend, or information when other policies are executed. Another category is transformation. In this category we have the header injection and header removal policy, which lets you add or delete HTTP headers to the request or response of a message. And last but not least, the compliance category. Those policies are useful to identify who is actually using and accessing your different applications, as well as making your users compliant with certain browser policies. For this category, we have the cross-origin resource sharing policy available, as well as the client ID enforcement policy. But what should I do if I can't find a policy to solve my problem? Well, in this case, you could develop your own custom policy in four general steps. First, you will need to set up a project in AnyPoint Studio with the required files in it. The easiest way to set up all your required files is by using the Maven archetype. After you've set up the project, you can update the logic as necessary with your requirements. Step two is to package your policy. You can use the Mule Maven plugin to package your custom policy into a deployable jar file that you can later apply to an API. In step three, you will need to upload your policy to Exchange. For this step, you have two choices. You can either deploy your policy using the Maven archetype or you can do so by manually setting up your Exchange deployment configurations. And the last step is the same as with out-of-the-box policies, where you can go into API Manager, see your new custom policy and apply it to your APIs or make it an automated policy. Now that we've seen what kind of policies are available, you might ask yourself which policies make sense for you to apply. And looking into this diagram, we can see that every policy adds some latency onto our request. Some policies add more latency and some policies less. The critical point here is, you shouldn't apply all of the available policies to your APIs, as this will increase latency. Instead, treat it like a toolbox from where you can pick and choose those policies that make sense for your use case. Now let's look into some of our general best practices when working with API Manager. First thing is to always label your API instances in API Manager. This makes it easier to read from any point exchange which instances are available because without labeling you will only see the instance ID. Then be careful with automated policies. Only use it where it really makes sense as not every policy makes sense for every API. You can also set up the execution order of policies. So put your policies into a meaningful order as executing a caching policy before a rate limiting policy doesn't make much sense, for example. Another recommendation is to use API auto discovery whenever possible to save resources. If you're not familiar with the concept of API auto discovery, check out the link to the API auto discovery versus API proxies friends of Max overview. You can find the link below the video. The more APIs you're creating, the more important it gets to have guidelines. So you should define your own set of guidelines of which policies to apply to which layer of the API-led connectivity approach. We will see one example of such a guideline later on. Another best practice is to create reusable RAML fragments for required API policies and publish them to any point exchange so that they can be already applied during design time. The best practices regarding the use of certain policies are Client ID enforcement should always be the minimum for all of your APIs and applications to ensure a minimum of access security and make traffic traceable. If we talk about external facing APIs or experience APIs, then OAuth 2.0 is the de facto standard. IP allow listing and deny listing should be taken into consideration when you want to allow traffic only from your internal network for certain APIs. And JSON or XML threat protection should be applied to your experience APIs to prevent them from being attacked with heavy payload sizes. As we've seen earlier, rate limiting can be applied both SLA based and non-SLA based. 
For system APIs, we recommend to go with SLA-based rate limiting to protect your backend system and also use a manual approval approach to keep an overview of which apps are accessing your backend systems. For process APIs, it depends on the use case and the requirements. Generally, we would recommend to go with the SLA-based approach. If you take the non-SLA-based approach, our recommendation is to apply the client ID enforcement policy on top to trace who is accessing your process APIs. Experience APIs should only be protected with an SLA-based approach, and you might also consider to protect the rate limit header from being exposed. The spy control policy should only be used for system APIs and process APIs, as they are designed to protect backend systems from temporary API invocation bursts. For experience APIs, the use of spy control is not recommended, as it can lead to a bad user experience. Okay, we've seen some recommendations. Let's now look into an example of which policies make sense within the API-led approach. So as we've already said, Client ID enforcement should always be the minimum for all of your APIs. OAuth 2.0 is the standard for external APIs and hence should be applied to experience APIs. IP deny listing and allow listing is not bounded to a specific layer of APIs. JSON and XML thread protection is highly recommended for external APIs sitting in the experience layer. And Rate limiting SLA based can be easily applied to all layers of APIs. And as mentioned earlier, the spike control policy can lead to a bad user experience if applied to an experience API, so we would recommend this policy only for system and process APIs. It's important to know that this is just an example and it will vary based on the use case and your requirements. So take this example as an inspiration and modify it to fit your needs. Thanks for watching this Friends of Max overview. Feel free to leave a comment, check out the links below the video, and don't forget to watch the other Friends of Max videos too. I hope to see you again soon.